Welcome to Worship Columbine. Here I am sitting by the church and just admiring at how beautiful it is with the new paint and trim and you can see our roll-up garage over here and there's just so much happening at our church and um, in the building and what we have going on. You will be hearing more and more about what we have coming up this fall and we are so excited about everything we have planned. This week we have a worship service at the Audubon at 9 a.m. You pull into the parking lot and the amphitheater is right there close by. There we have just a short service with a message, a little bit of a discussion, and of course some prayer and greeting some of your fellow Columbine friends. And we also have work days from 9.30 to 11.30. TAG, our facilities director, will have plenty of projects um, that you can work on specifically to help get us ready to get back into the building. It has been a long journey and sometimes we don't know where the journey is taking us. We do know that our journey does end and begin back in our building. We do have to wait a little bit longer and be flexible, but friends, we're up to the task. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and we look forward to worshiping with you um, whether that's in person at the Audubon or continued in this online space this virtual space so now if you'll join me in our opening prayer God of beginnings God of endings and God of everything in between we come here today not always knowing what the end looks like, but knowing that you are with us every step of the way, that you guide us, that you lead us with your divine light, and that you comfort us when we're in the unknown. God, it's that blessing that I pray over all of our friends today. Amen. Join us this morning as we worship in song, in prayer, take communion together, and hear Steve's sermon. Thanks.
Hey friends, it's great to come to you here today. Thank you, Jill and Samantha and Joe for the great music. Thank you, Tag, for weaving this all together. This is a whole staff effort and we bring this to you to hopefully it'll nurture your soul today. Hey, my uh, scripture passage for today is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. Listen for God's word as I read it to you today. This is from the Apostle Paul. Paul, Paul writes, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been closed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And there are the passage end. May God bless these words as I seek to apply them to our lives. Hey, it's Labor Day. What do you do on Labor Day? Well, you barbecue. And so I'm going to barbecue a little surf and turf here while we're preaching. If I do this right, by the time the sermon is done, the steaks and the salmon will be done. So let me see if I can do this. This will be a first to preach and grill at the same time. So I'm going to put these babies on. You can put your barbecue on as we get ready for Labor Day. I always set my watch to make sure I'm timing everything. So let me get that going. Okay, now we can talk and grill. So Labor Day, how did it get to be Labor Day? Wasn't it just Memorial Day? And we had the entire summer stretched out in front of us. And now, and then it was like the 4th of July. Like, how did that happen? And now it's... Labor Day. You know, I know the summer doesn't officially come to an end until uh, September 22nd, so we still have a few weeks left. But Labor Day always kind of feels like this uh, official ending and official beginning. An ending of summer, the beginning of fall, the ending. You know, I, Labor Day is a kind of a big, uh, big holiday for me. Not that I, you know, do a big a Labor Day celebration. Well, I guess we do. The family's going to get together to do some grilling later this afternoon. I'm doing some cooking right now to kind of get ready. But you know, uh, it's a beginning and ending. It's the end of the summer. And I always use these times like this to think about what's past and what's to come. What it is I just lived through what is yet ahead of me? You know, I do this throughout the year. I do this on uh, January 1st. I do this on my birthday, April 10th. I do it on Memorial Day, and then I do it again on Labor Day. It's a way of kind of me checking in with my sense of direction, my sense of purpose, my sense of goals. You know, I think you can do this at any time. You know, I often do it at the beginning of, the, of a month and say, okay, what do I want to accomplish this month? What are my goals? What are my purposes with this month? And now I do this with the year, where well, I'm going to do this with the fall. So do this with me. Let's think backwards and let's think forwards. First of all, let me check my steak and my salmon. Everything's to be seems to be going right, so I can keep on going. So let's think back to the summer. What did you do this past summer that was fun? What was the highlight of your summer? You know, for me, it was the wedding of my Kelsey to her Kyle Walters. It was a great celebration, months in the planning. It rained like crazy on the day of the wedding, but it broke right at the four o'clock for the wedding ceremony. You heard me talk about that in past sermons. It was a great time, it was a great time. What about you, what was your highlight? Did you go on a vacation? Did you go to the beach? Did you go to the mountains? Did you go to Europe? You know, kind of traveling in the middle of COVID, you're more courageous than I am. I'm still kind of jumpy about the COVID virus. But uh, maybe there was a family reunion that you went to. Something, what was the highlight of the summer? What was something that you were looking forward to last year that you brought to fulfillment this past summer? Celebrate that. Look back and celebrate that. And then I want you to think about the past. What is it that you need to let go of? 
What was it from this past summer that you've been dragging around? Something like baggage in your life that you need to let go of. You know, there have been several times where I've traveled with Columbine uh, on big, uh, big European trips. We went to, actually went to Israel. We went to Ireland. We went to Italy. Uh, great trips that we, that we took together as a church. I'll never forget some people, they brought like steamer trunks of clothes with them that they were hauling throughout the trip. And I used to think to myself, man, why are you traveling so heavy? Why can't you just travel light? It's just 10 or 12 days, travel light. And I begin to realize that's kind of a metaphor for people in their lives. Some of you live carrying a lot of baggage in your life. You have a steamer trunk full of issues and anger and resentment. And you know what? I want to ask you, do you really want to drag that stuff around like you're on a European trip? Travel light. You know what? It's time. It's time to let go. It's time to forgive. It's time to finally get to a place in your life where you can forgive your parents, forgive your siblings, forgive your children, forgive your aunts and uncles. You know, I always say that you can be angry with your parents until you're age 40. And with age 40, if you're still angry with your parents, then you know what? It's your problem, not theirs. It's time to get over it so that you can live a full and satisfying adult life. What do you need to let go of? I'm checking my clock. Oh, I need to check my steak. Hold on just a second. Let me turn my steak. The steak, the salmon still looks good. But I always like to turn the steak at about three or four minutes. You all, well, I'm going to hear about all your barbecuing styles. I have mine. Okay, now that's what you've let go of. Now let's think about the future. Let's think about what you're going to be doing now for the fall through the, through the end of the year. What is that? September, October, November, December, four months. What's going to happen in these four months? You know, we have the big holidays coming up. It's a holiday season. We have uh, Halloween. We have Thanksgiving. We have Christmas. We have New Year's. The days are going to get real short. It's going to get dark. It's going to get cold. So many of you hate that. I love it. I love the coming of winter. I just, I love the cold. I don't mind the dark at all. For me, it's a, it's a great fun season. Some of you uh, just can't stand that. I know that. I will walk with you. We'll get you through that. It will get you to the happy times of your life. All right, so we have the holidays coming. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your future? See, I believe in being intentional. What do you want to accomplish? What is it that you're supposed to be doing with your life? See, that's the key question for me. If you think about what you're supposed to be doing with your life, it gets kind of to a divine intention. God has some expectations for you in your life that you're supposed to be doing. What is that going to be? What is that you're supposed to be doing? What are you willing to change? What new goals are you willing to set to fulfill that it is what you're supposed to be doing? Let's think about this. Let's say that you only had a year left to live. How would you alter your life to fulfill that expectation of what it is that God wants you to do, what you're supposed to be doing with your life? You know, I had a, uh, a situation that I ran into a couple of weeks ago that has really stayed with me. Um, a man was in his uh, mid-60s, early 60s, actually 63, 64, he went in for surgery. Uh, he had a small tumor on his neck and uh, they did the surgery and they found out that he had a huge mass in his lung, inoperable, that had metastasized throughout his entire body. They came out of surgery. They told him about it. They said, you might have six to nine months left to live. Man, that really kind of shook me up. You know, I do this for my living. I'm around this all the time. But even still, I think for some reason this one hit me. Maybe because I'm 62 and I thought to myself, man, am I ready to die? Have I done, you know, I have a long bucket list of things that I want to do. Would I be willing to let all that go? Would I feel as though that I've lived a full, fulfilled life to be able to let go? What about you? Where are you at with that? 
You know, it's hard to think about life coming to an end. Sometimes we think about, you know, what would you do if you only had a day left to live or a month left to live? I think that's too hard. I think your life is kind of panicky when you think about a month left to live. But if you have a year left to live, then it kind of stretches out a little bit. And you think about what would I need to change, adjust, let go of, focus on, to get ready to die. What would you need to do to change to make sure this last year of your life was significant? What would you need to change and what would you need to do? You know, for me, what happens if I think about the last year of my life, I think about resurrection. You know, for me, I always, uh, I preached about this a couple of weeks ago. I said that, um, You go to things that cannot be shaken when life shakes. You go to that which cannot be shaken. And you see, and resurrection for me is that which cannot be shaken. Okay, let me check the steak and the salmon one more time. I mean, we're grilling, right? Let me do this. Oh, the salmon's getting nice and juicy. I'm going to flip that over. The steak is doing good. Flip that over. This is going to be good. Right when the sermon is over on Labor Day, the dinner is going to be ready. Okay, resurrection. For me, when I think about if I only had nine months to a year left to live, I would get crystal clear about what I believed about the resurrection. For me, this is something that cannot be shaken. You know, it is the heart and soul of my life. It is the heart and soul of my faith. I sit beside people's bed when they're dying and I tell them, believe in the resurrection. I mean, for me, that's the, it comes down to that. It's nine months left to live, a year left to live. You better get really clear with what you believe about happens after you die. That's what I love about this passage that I read this, uh, read for the video uh, from 1 Corinthians. Um, Paul is talking with the church at Corinth about what he believes about the resurrection. And he says some key things. He says, listen, I will tell you a mystery. You know, ultimately, it's a mystery. We don't know what's going to happen to us exactly after we die. We have some few insights that Paul says. He says, we will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye. You know, I I was thinking about this uh, last week. There was a bad wreck on 285, kind of near where we live. And uh, a family going down the road and some people were driving out of control and there was a head-on wreck. And uh, several, uh, a mom or I think a grandmother and two-year-old child were killed. Other people were injured. And like, you know, it happens in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye. Their lives are gone. They were just going down the road. Their lives are gone. What would that be like to have it just gone? What was your family member? What would it be like to have it just gone? It kind of forces you to think about resurrection. What do you believe? Because you know, I think that happens even if it's a slow death that you have of cancer and illness, old age, you know, when you die, I don't really believe you just go to the ground and you're rotting. You know, you just go into your casket, you're, you know, you're cremated, whatever. In fact, my mother told me about this new thing where you can donate, where you can uh, pay to have your body decomposed <laughs> and you come back in some topsoil. I love that. I thought that was crazy. All right. Resurrection. What happens to you after you die? It's quick. It's fast in the twinkling of an eye. Paul says, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be changed, they'll be raised imperishable. We will all be changed. We have this perishable body, and when we die, we put on the imperishable. We have mortal bodies. When we die, we put on immortality. It's kind of a beautiful, breathtaking thing to think about. Immortality imperishable. I think that's God's vision for our lives, that we're going to be completely and totally fulfilled with God's purpose in our life, the resurrection. And then Paul, he continues on, he says, because of this, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now, let's be true. Death is hard. 
death is painful. But if we can think about the resurrection, it takes the sting of death away. We know that though we die, yet shall we live. We know that when our loved ones die, yet shall they live. Though they die, yet shall they live. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Paul says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's victory. If I have a year left to live, if I have nine months left to live, I'm thinking about victory that's going to happen to me. Victory. It's going to be resurrection overcoming death. That's what I believe is going to happen if I have nine months left to live. And when I think about my life for the next six, six months left to live, I think about resurrection as well. Then Paul says, he says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you, move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. <coughs> See, for me, what that talks about is life. Resurrection goes two ways. Here's my wife walking into the house. Ignore that woman in the background. <laughs> Our life goes in two ways. We have the resurrection out in front of us, and we have life, and the resurrection affects our life. Paul says, stand, stand firm. Live your life, knowing that what you labor for when you labor for the Lord is not in vain. Resurrection affects how you live right now. How you live right now. How are you living? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you frit frittering away your life, not really just kind of meandering day to day? Or is it some kind of driving purpose that is pushing you forward? Look at You stand at Labor Day. It is the end of summer. But it is the beginning of something brand new whole new season ahead of you and maybe a whole new life so it's 17 minutes i think everything is ready to go let me double check you hold on right there oh it looks perfect it looks perfect the salmon is done the steak is done look at that grilled perfection i'm going to preach more often when i cook <laughs> the and the sermon will time the cooking perfectly. Thanks, folks. We'll see you. Thank you, Steve. We need to be reminded of this message of renewal, of restoration, of resurrection throughout the year, right? Um, why do we only talk about it in Easter? It's an everyday message. So as we prepare to pray, we also want to take a moment to pause because here we are at the beginning of a month again. At Columbine, every Sunday we do communion, but on the first of each month, we do communion like we stop and settle and center and do communion maybe in a more formal way. So today I invite you to get your elements for communion. You can pause if you're watching the video in my life today, I have an Oreo and milk. It's a reminder of the common elements that Jesus gathered around. It doesn't have to be sacred, blessed by a priest. Jesus chose common elements to remind his disciples of his presence with them. And so in the same way, we remember the night that Jesus gathered around a table and after washing his disciples' feet, he took bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took a cup. The cup was the cup of the new covenant, covenant of love, his love poured out for all of us. And so in the same way, we remember as we gather around our common elements, whatever they may be, we remember Jesus's life, 
his death and his resurrection. And this reminder and this assurance and resurrection of new life and hope. And so on this day, take your common elements, whatever they may be. And remember, this is the body broken for you. And this is the cup of love poured out for you. Take. Would you join with me in prayer? God, we thank you for the reminder of your love with us at this table. We thank you for the reminder and resurrection and renewal of rebirth and hope. And these cycles of renewal that are present with us all the time, all around us. We think of this day for our, um, of the broken places in our world. We think of those who are recovering, trying to put life back together, clean up, and assess the devastation after the hurricane in Louisiana again. We pray for the people of Louisiana. We pray for the people of New Orleans. We pray for the rescue workers who have gone into difficult places. We continue to pray for nations who have been um, just devastated by natural disasters as well, like Haiti. We think of the ongoing recovery, rebuilding, and medical needs in nations like Haiti. And we continue to pray and lift up the nation of Afghanistan. We think of the women and the plight of the women in Afghanistan. Our heart is with them and so many children who suffer. And so we pray. We pray for um, Afghanistan as a nation as they try to figure out how to put back together. We pray for aid workers, for helpers, for missionaries, for people on the ground who are for the people of Afghanistan. Each of us I imagine as we pray, has our own places in the world, has our own places in this nation, has our own places in our community and in our families where our hearts break. And we give you those places, trusting that you are with us as a compassionate, renewing, hopeful force for all of creation. And this day, as your people, we join our spirits and our voices, even as we are so spread out in time and space, to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for being with us for communion. Thanks for being with us today. I hope you're having a great Labor Day weekend, enjoying whatever you are doing. Here's our last song, and we hope to see you face to face soon.
Folks, dinner was fantastic. I love salmon. My wife had the steak. I love salmon. The kids, they'll be eating something else when they come over later. What are you going to do for Labor Day? I hope that you can have a lot of fun. Eat something great. Celebrate the end of the year. You know, a couple of things. I want to thank all of you for your generous giving. Uh, keep it up. We need your monthly giving to keep us strong as we head into the fall. You know, the building is coming along. We just have to be patient. Um, we are hoping that by 
The first Sunday of October will be in the building, but we were told that the first Sunday of August, first Sunday of September, now the first Sunday of October. It'll happen. We just have to be patient. We have to hang in there. You know, uh, pay attention. You can worship with us at the Audubon Center. We have a lot of different things going on. We're going to be starting our small groups up later in September. A lot of good things happening that you can participate in. So even though we're dispersed, we can still stay together. So, what are you going to take from this sermon? What are you going to take from this service? Are you going to live? Are you going to let go so you can celebrate your great future? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? That's the key. God wants you to live a happy and fulfilled life. What is it that you're supposed to be doing? Because that leads you to the resurrection, the great promise to God in our future and in the middle of our lives. May God bless you and keep you, shape you and mold you, love you and hold you. This day forth, now and forevermore. Amen.